Andy Johnson. We are looking at creating meaning with print, neurocognitive approach to reading instruction. And this is for a conference with the Japanese Association of Language Teaching. So let's get down to it. We're looking at theoretical models. And research is used to create theories. Educational research is used to create the theories upon which we design educational policies and practices. Useful theories are based on a lot of data collected from a lot of different theories. Each one of these bits of data are connected like a dot-to-dot -dot picture. Different Theories connect different data dots differently. For example, these are all types of learning theories, cognitive learning theory, behavioral learning theory, based on research data. But they all connect the data dots a bit differently, and they all explain learning from different perspectives. That's what a theory is. Theories are used to explain a set of facts and to understand phenomena. Theoretical models are based on theories and are used to explain how things work. Theoretical models of reading help us understand the process of reading. They're designed to evaluate instructional practices to design instructional practices, but the theoretical model of reading one adheres to determines the research questions, the type of data collected, the methodology, and how that data are interpreted. There are two common theoretical models that we are going to explore. The phonological processing model, and the neurocognitive model, sometimes called the psycholinguistic model. Each one provides a vastly different view of reading and the reading process. Each one understands reading a bit differently. So let's take a look first at the phonological processing model. From this perspective, input data from the text goes to the thalamus, the, re the relay station in the brain, to the phonological processing cueing system, and it goes one way. All right, this is a bit outdated. According to this model, reading is simply sounding out words. James Hoffman calls this the simple view of reading. According to this simple view of reading, reading is said to involve four sub-processes that occur instantly. As you're reading, you perceive the words and letters on the page. You put sounds to the letters in each of the words. You put individual sounds together to identify words, and you put the words together to create ideas. All that is said to have happened in the microseconds that you view, view each word. According to this model, then, reading creates a form of speech in the head to which, with which the reader simply listens during reading. According to this model, proficient reader is one who can sound out words automatically and fluently, so the speech in the head is uninterrupted. And you see the phonological processing model, the simple view, words on the page, taken in by our senses, by our eyes, or if you're blind, by our fingers, go to the relay station, the thalamus, and up to the cortex. That's a one-way flow of information, according to this model. According to this model, proficient readers can sound out words automatically, without difficulty. The speech in the head is uninterrupted. Struggling readers have sounding out word deficits. From this perspective, struggling readers need more sounding out word instruction 
and more sounding out word practice. The goal of instruction according to this model is to create good sounder outers. If students were proficient with this skill, all their reading problems would vanish, so it says. But what happens when they get a heavy dose of sounding out instruction, heavy dose of phonics instruction? Students get marginally better at sounding out words in isolation in the short term. If you teach a meaningless reading subskill, students will get better at that reading subskill. But there's no meaning involved here. If you pour sand on the kitchen floor, you're going to get higher measures of sand on the kitchen floor. Doesn't mean the dishes are going to get washed. Doesn't mean there's a causal factor in washing dishes. What else happens when you focus on sounding out word instruction? There's little of transfer of these skills to authentic reading conditions. They learn the skill here, the reading subskill in isolation here, but they're actually reading books over there. These skills don't transfer to authentic reading conditions. And we don't want children to sound out words. We want them to create meaning with print. That's the goal of reading instruction. Long term. There is no significant improvement in students' ability to create meaning with print with authentic text. Heavy reading and writing with meaning-based phonics instruction is more impactful, more effective than isolated skills instruction, focusing only on sounding out words, only on phonics. The phonological processing model, we said that the theory connects a series of data dots, but the phonological model has some data dots unaccounted for, data that is unaccounted. First of all, proficient readers look at only 60% of the words on the page. How do you account for that? Readers are using more than words on the page in letters to create meaning. They're using semantic information and syntactic information. As well, our eyes fixate on the, only those 60% of the words. We can only perceive that which we fixate on. Our eyes do not move in a straight line as we read. They move kind of like hummingbirds. And here you can see eye movement. The little dots represent where the eyes stop. That's called the fixation. And you see the eyes going back and forth. Our brain fills in the blanks and gives the illusion that we're reading in a straight line smoothly from left to right. How do you account for that data? How do you account for this data? Proficient readers often insert words that are semantically or syntactically correct. Semantic means meaning is retained. The boy ran down the road, but the reader says the boy run down the road. How do you account for that? Even though there's eyes fixed right on that word ran, readers will often say run, proficient readers. Or syntactically correct. The girl jumped on the bench, but says bed. Syntactically, a noun for a noun, that is correct. So we can assume that the reader is using what's in his or her head as he or she creates meaning with text. You, the reader is using minimal letter cues to create meaning. And here's an interesting one. As we're reading, there are more nerve fibers going down from the cortex to the thalamus than up from the thalamus to the cortex, almost 10 to 1. 
That means there's more information flowing down as you read to the thalamus and out than from the words on the page up, almost 10 to 1. Clearly, we are using what's in the head to create meaning with print to understand. And how do you account for this? During the act of reading, information in the cortex, what's in your head, is being used to direct the eyes during reading. Higher level processes drive or mediate lower level processes. The eyes are directed by information in the cortex more so than information on the page. Meaning again, Information in the head is used to direct the eyes, more so the information on the page. How do you account for that with the phonological processing model? The neurocognitive model of reading accounts for all this data. It is a more complete model of reading. It helps us understand. According to this model, we take in input from the page, goes to the relay station, the thalamus. We use three cueing systems, our brain does, to recognize words, and up to the cortex. But there's more information flowing down than flowing up with this model. According to this model, sometimes called the psycholinguistic model, Reading's not sounding out words. Well, there's part of that involved, but reading is creating meaning with print. It's a thinking process, not a responding process, as dictated in the phonological processing model. Without meaning, you are not reading. You are simply responding. The brain uses not one cueing system to recognize words, during the act of reading, phonics or the graphophonetic cueing systems. It uses all three, and we'll talk about this in just a second, semantics, which is background knowledge, and syntax, which is grammar and word order. And readers use what's in their head to make sense of what's on the page. For example, I can read about things related to literacy very quickly and easily because there's a lot up here related to literacy. Things about computer programming, not so much. There's not up, much up here to help me make sense of what's on the page. As I said, the brain uses three cueing systems to recognize words during the act of reading. Let's identify them. Semantics, context, meaning, what's in our head? We use the context of the sentence to recognize what on the page. Most can say words. The monkey ate a ba. Fish women sheath down the hill. Our brain fills in the blanks. Various parts of the brain work together to create meaning to recognize words. This, by the way, is the most efficient in terms of the amount of space taken up in short-term memory. Syntax, which is grammar or word order or sentence structure such as tense and plurality. She blanked down the hill. We know that's a verb that gives us a clue. It cues us in as to what that word might be, and we use a minimal letter Q at most, and we use context. Fish, blank in the water, we know it's a verb. The blank sat in the sun, we know it's a noun, a something sat in the sun. And the dog, blank on the rug, did something, it's a verb. All these cue us in as to what the words might mean. And the third one, the phonological cueing system, this is the least efficient in terms of the amount of space taken up. Cognitive processing time and space in working memory. Working memory has a very small capacity. It can hold seven plus or minus two bits of information for about 15 seconds 
before it begins to fade. I can hold seven letters, seven words, or seven ideas. Which one is more efficient and effective and impactful for creating meaning with print? Focusing only on letters impedes students' progress. Sounding out words, if that's all you do, that is going to impede students' progress. Other things to consider. During the act of reading, your brain actually uses as few letter clues as possible to recognize words. We don't look at all the letters. We don't need all the letters. We use a schema, which is a file folder in your head related to knowledge. We don't read that way. It would take far too long. It would use too much space in working memory to read that way. We use minimal letter clues. And our eyes do not stop on every word. Let me give you an example. Sound out this word. If we're reading as the phonological mo uh, processing model posits, letter by letter, from left to right, word by word, let's sound this word out. S -s st, 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 a, sta, stam. Yeah, it's stam. Stamp. Oh, it's a stamp. Stamp, yes. Oh, it's stampy. Stampy. Stamped. Oh, yes. He stamped. Oh, no, it's stampede. Stampede. Our brain does not go through that process during reading, during the microseconds available as we encounter this word in a sentence, in print. We see the word holistically within a context. The buffalo started to stampede. As we see it in that context, we don't go s t m p stampy stamped stampy. We don't do that. We see it holistically within that context. Vowels are not very important to demonstrate. All the vowels have been removed except for the initial vowels. Let's see if we can create meaning with this. Hmm. Once upon a time, there was a handsome prince. He lived in a castle. One day, an evil wizard came and turned him into a frog. You get the idea. You may not be able to recognize all the words, but most of the words, because you're using semantics and syntax to create meaning with print. If vowels are so important, can anyone read a sentence in which all the consonants are removed? Just the vowels, if they're that important. Nope. And even looking at the picture, that does not give you any clues. Now, I bet you could get most of them. The big black bear ran through the woods. We spend a lot of time with vowels, with diagraphs, triographs, diphthongs, all that stuff. It's not really that important. You still don't believe me? Let me give you a little proof of the three queuing systems. The following paragraph contains 110 words. Read the paragraph as quickly as you can. Okay, you may have gotten some or part of it. Now, read the same 110 words a second time, as quickly as you can. You may even want to time yourself. Same 110 words. Away, drove, and car, his, in. All right, you're probably reading like this. Away, drove, and car, his, in, jumped, could, he, as fast, as, ran. Notice the difference in your eye movement. Your eyes probably fixated on every word. 
a wave drove in like this. Get used to watching the eyes of your readers. It tells you a lot. Read the first one more like this. Notice the fluency. Notice the pace. Notice the stumbles, miscues, and self-corrections. Go ahead and read that quietly to yourself again. And again, notice the difference. With this one, you probably sounded a lot like a struggling reader. The words were the same in both paragraphs. What was different was the word order, the grammar, the punctuation, context, and meaning. If reading was simply sounding out words as the phonological processing model posits, your rate, accuracy, and fluency should have been the same with both paragraphs, but it wasn't, because we use syntax and semantics to create meaning with print, not to sound out words. So what are the implications, the applications? Reading instruction and interventions should include activities that develop all three queuing systems the semantic queuing system, the syntactic, writing is the best one there, and the phonological uh, queuing system. Often happens, especially with struggling readers or second language learners, they get a heavy dose of that, and that impedes their progress to create meaning with print. Reading instruction should be as meaningful as possible, using authentic text to the greatest extent possible. We need to limit those instances where students study isolated words, words out of any meaningful context. I recommend using analytic phonics instruction. This is where you analyze words that you are reading or writing about. Find a word with the d, d sound. Find a word with a ch, ch sound in the middle. You're connecting letter sounds to what they're using in print. Uh, analytic phonics is one of the more effective ways to teach phonics, to teach letter sounds. Phonics is important, absolutely. It's necessary, but not sufficient. If that's all you're teaching your struggling readers, you're giving your struggling readers one-third of a reading education. Use the language experience approach or language experience activities. These are great because they use words and experiences within that student's life. Simply, the student dictates to you, and you can do this individually or in small group or even in large group. You write down what they say, either on a poster, a large piece of paper, uh, a small piece of paper if you're working individually, or on a computer screen somehow. I like using a computer screen. It's quick. It's easy. They can see the words as they're appearing. I can save them, and we can easily read them back another day. When I'm working with students, I usually indicate a, number of minim a minimum number of sentences. First graders, a minimum of two se uh, sentences. Second and third, a minimum of three to five, and, and you get the idea. Once they have their story, which is a paragraph, you practice rereading that paragraph until they can read it fluently. Again, they're using words, their words that they know of, and their experiences that they know of and that they have words for. Then we do short analytic phonics with the words that they have created. Find a word has, that has the br, br blend at the beginning, t, t at the end. This is an example of a first grade student's minimum, a struggling reader, minimum of, of two words or two sentences. We always started with reading the old story, and we read that through until fluency was achieved. And then we did the new story and read that through until fluency was achieved. I did nothing. I went to the book fair. This develops self-efficacy as well because the student learns that he or she can do it with a little practice. 
This is a third grade student writing about what's occurring in his or her life, using his or her words. You've got to practice. All right, a bit of transition. We see not with our eyes, but with our brains. We're going to look at how our eyes and brains are used during the context of reading. When we perceive, we see with our brains, not our eyes, it just creates the image that we are seeing with our eyes. We see what we see is simply light rays stimulating the nerves. Our brains have learned to make sense of this stuff that's painted in the brain. What we think we see is more important than what we actually see because our brain is using both to perceive, to direct our eyes, and to create meaning with print. We have a blind spot created by the optic nerve at the back of our eyeballs. We don't notice it because our brain is busy filling in the blanks. So to create a picture of reality, our eyeballs need to move like a scanner on the grocery store uh, to create meaning. We cannot see our eyeballs never stay still. They're moving about like hummingbirds, taking little snapshots. Everything else becomes blurry. You don't believe me? Here's an experiment. Fixate only on the circle in the middle. Don't allow your eyeballs to move. What do you notice about the letters in the periphery? They become blurry because we need our eyeballs to move to see a complete picture. And then we see it clear. But what's actually happening is our, we're taking little snapshots and our brain is busy filling in the blanks. Next time you're driving down the road, Notice your eyeballs. You don't look at a steady, your eyeballs aren't steady looking at the horizon. Your eyeballs are moving around taking little snapshots. Experiment number two. Notice where your eyeballs travel. Your eyeballs are not still. They're usually going, probably going like this. This is an actual eye movement study. You notice we tend to look like this whenever we look at a face. And then we go, our brain, and we think we see it. We can only perceive that which we fixate or stop on. Our brain is filling in the blanks whenever we look at anything. We have three visual reg regions in the brain. The foveal takes up 1 to 2 percent. It's said to be a size of a grape at arm's length. We can see clearly there three to six letters. As we read, we're seeing three to six letters clearly at a time. Our brain is filling in the blanks. The parafovio, which is 24 to 30 letters, we see them not very clearly. And then the peripheral region is everything else, which is a little fuzzy. Here's another example of the foveal, parafoveal, and peripheral. It looks like we see things clearly because our eyeball is moving around, taking little snapshots, and our brain is filling in the blanks. So the question is, with this very small in-focus viewing area, how is anybody able to read more than 10 words a minute? How is it possible? Again, the reader uses minimal letter and word clues. The brain is filling in the blanks, making predictions and filling them in as you are reading. That's the process the brain uses to create meaning with print. We perceive only three to six letters. We use semantics and syntax. To predict the meaning, the brain is a meaning-making machine, a predicting machine, not a sounding-out word machine. We're filling in the blanks. To operate efficiency, our brain doesn't replicate what it sees on the page or out there in reality. 
to operate efficiently, our brain takes in only the most salient elements and fills in the blanks. This is how our brain has evolved. For example, if you're out walking in the woods, you see a shape that looks like a snake. That image goes immediately to the amygdala. Your brain fills in the blanks and says, oh, snake, better not step there. Fill in the blanks. As you're able to process top down, you're able to look. So it's a dual process. It's called a low road, quick and dirty, and a high road. Quick and dirty, it goes right to the amygdala, so you're able to respond. That's the fast one. That's the low road. But that information is also goes to the cortex. That's the high road. With this one, we're using top-down information so we can make that immediate reaction so we don't get bit by the mistake snake. Our brain does not have to fill in all the blanks to perceive that's a snake. It reacts quickly and immediately. It fills in the blanks. Our brain does not replicate reality. It does not record like a video recorder. Memory does not regurgitate reality. It replicates, it reconstructs a version of reality. For example, these are all different pictures of Lady Gaga. Notice they're all a little bit different. I'm able to see that's Lady Gaga because my brain has taken in just the essential Gaga elements, probably the nose, eyes, mouth, and I'm filling in the blanks with each one so I can recognize who that is. The brain constructs a version of reality. Again, reading is not sounding out words. People who cannot hear can read. It's creating meaning with print. So let's take a look at some interesting stuff. Eye movement and miscue analysis. Emma, eye movement miscue analysis research. This enables people to study reading online as it's happening. This is a more realistic portrayal of reading than asking students to list a word or a set of nonsense words and attach a scanner to the brain. They're actually reading. You can watch their eyeballs as they read. And I said it before, get used to watching the eyeballs of your readers as they're reading. You learn a lot. Eyeballs that generally move in a smooth line, that demonstrates an efficient reader, a mature reader. Eyeballs that go like this represents a struggling reader. And you may need to do some fluency activities and some other things. Eyes of your readers tell you much. The saccades reading, these are the skips that the eyes make while reading as they go from word to word. And as you see, you don't they don't land on every word. And you can only perceive three to six letters clearly. So you're using periphery and your brain is filling in. Fixations are where the eyeballs actually land. And regressions are when the eyeballs go back. So when we read, we're more like a hummingbird than going in a straight line. When we read text. Our eyes do not move in a straight line across the page. They make skips from word to word. Now in Emma, eye movement miscue analysis studies, the dot represents where the eyeballs actually move. The line represents, that would be a regression, regression, and you see the regression. And the size of the little dot represents the amount of time you spent on each word. And we land on only about 60% of the words, as we will see. We need to get rid of this fallacy of the orderly straight line as we read, because we have saccades and we have regressions. We don't fixate on every word. 
and we don't read words in order. 30 to 40 percent of the words are skipped. And you can see the size of the dot represents the amount of time spent there. The length of the word doesn't matter. When they compared the length of words that were skipped or omitted or did not, they did not fixate on, the size doesn't make any difference. We jumped over small words. We jumped over short words. The length of the word was not the variable in the words that our eyeballs skipped or went over. We tended to skip more function words, words that served a grammatical function, and skip fewer content words, words that carry meaning. So it wasn't the length of the word, it was the function of the word. Did it carry meaning in and of itself, or was it a word like an, in, the, of, a? We tend to skip those words, our eyeballs do. We jump over them. And again, the reader is getting information from the parafoveal to recognize these words. And you're recognizing this is about what it looks like. You can see that clearly. You're taking in information a little bit out in front of like that to predict what the next word might be. The cortex, what's up in your head, is directing the eyes where to fixate, where to land next. Remember, we can only perceive clearly that which we fixate on, where our eyeballs stop and take a little miniature snapshot. So your eyeball is going, psht, 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 psht. It's not fixating on that. The predictability of the word affects the fixation time and the skip. If a word is not very predictable, we spend more time on there, a bigger circle. If it's predictable and we land on it, we spend just a little time on it. Bigger circles, more fixation time. And this would be the order. And notice here's a regression. We don't read like this, we read like this, we go like that, regression. Saccades, fixations, regressions. Paulson has done some very interesting studies. He examined words that readers omitted or substituted while reading orally. He had a student read a piece of text orally, as a student is right here, out loud and then track in the eyes with one of these uh, neat eye scanner things. And he looked at miscues and eye movements to analyze reading as it was occurring online, as it was actually occurring. Now, a miscue is when what the student says does not match what's on the page. Before they left, the reader inserted the word leave. That's a miscue. You don't call them mistakes and I'll get to that in a minute. The first little pig bolt his house out of stray. All right, these are all different miscues that the reader inserted while reading. Anything that the reader says, if it doesn't match what's on the page, it's called a miscue. But there are different types of miscues. Miscues are not the same. There's a meaningful miscue, which makes sense within the context of the sentence. The reader uses what's in his head or her head to create meaning with this text. And that's a mature reading behavior. That's a meaningful miscue. There are meaning disrupting miscues. It disrupts the meaning. Doesn't make sense. The dog rug down the road. That does not make sense. There are grammatically correct miscues. These are interesting doesn't match, but it makes, grammatic, it makes grammatical sense. Again, that tells me that the reader is using syntactical clues as well as syntax. And then there's self-corrections, and we like that. That's when you, you make a miscue, you, move, you keep moving on, but then you go back, ah, and self-correct. 
That indicates metacognition, thinking about thinking. You stop and you realize, oh, that doesn't make sense. I need to go back. That's a good thing. That's a mature reading behavior. The results of this study. Omitted words or substitutions are often fixated on. That means the reader looked directly at the word and still omitted it. Read the sentence and, and skipped the word entirely instead of the very old man, the old man. But the reader stopped right on there, the eyeball fixed, fixated right on it. And they often omitted the word or substituted something else. How is that possible? Well, we know how it's possible. Top-down, semantics, grammatical, or syntax. Substitutions inserted a new word, even though the reader fixated right on there. Boop! Fixated on it. Hmm. That doesn't make sense. The phonological processing model doesn't account for that. Most words not fixated on are read without miscues. Most words that you don't even stop on, you skip right over, are read without any miscues at all. How is that possible if we're looking at every word and sounding out, seeing every letter? Eye movement reflects the meaning-making process where the brain predicts the next word. It shows there's a transaction between the reader and the text used to create meaning with print. Paulson also found that fixations often do not occur in order. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, all right? And oftentimes, if you read the sentence in order of the fixations, it doesn't make sense. Reading when, order of fixations, text gibberish often. Right? The brain often goes back. Paulson found that readers regress or go back 10 to 15% of the time. And the brain creates the illusion of the smooth, a smooth line. Gestalt, it's called, where the brain is filling in the blanks to create meaning. So, five conclusions. As I've said many times, we use information in the head, along with semantics and syntax, to make predictions as to what the next word could be. It's the predictions that enable us to make sense of those semi-blurred letters and the parafoveal uh, regions that enable us to read smoothly and quickly. So here are some implications. Number one, beginning readers need to read about things with which they are familiar. Beginning readers and second language readers should be reading books in which the words are in their lexicon. They understand them about concepts they know about and experiences with which they're familiar. Use the language experience approach or activities. We talked about that already. This is a good one. If a student stops on the word, teach the student to say blank and skip the word. You'll find most often, a word or two after the sentence, they'll go back and they'll self-correct. This, this teaches the students to use metacognition, and, and it's much faster. I was working with a student who would stop and try to sound out a word. It would take about 10 seconds. Once I taught her to say blank, she'd move on. Two seconds later, she'd know the word, and she'd go back and self-correct. 10 seconds versus 2 seconds. One is developing the semantic cueing system and the syntactic. One is forcing the child to focus only on the phonological cueing system. Remember, this is what I actually teach students. If you see a word you don't know, say blank and skip it. Let your eyes look for clues. And I would teach the student. That's an action. That's a clue that gives us a clue what your guess might be. And I present this sentence and actually have the child guess. And then I have the child guess again. And then I show them the sentence. And we do six to eight of these 
a day very quickly takes five to six minutes. And if I, I can, if I still want to develop the phonological cueing system, I can have these reinforce a vowel sound or a letter sound. Use maze and close activities to develop semantic and syntactic uh, cueing systems. This one re, uh, uh, reinforced the OT phonogram or word family, ot, ot. There are very blank gardens. This is a maze where you have two or three possible words. With younger students, I only include two. With older students, I include three. We go through these very quickly. And it's about concepts with which we're studying, but I'm also reinforcing the ot sound. The ot sound. So the child says blank, uses clues on both sides to figure out what the correct word is or might be. Six to eight of these, maybe 10. This should take six minutes or more. Go through very quickly. And a good instructional section, session. You have lots of little activities and then reading practice, more reading practice. Short A, okay, I'm a short O. I want to reinforce the short O. Maybe I had a mini lesson on the short O. Bob took his dog for a blank. You go through it very quickly. I'm reinforcing it by simply including A. Oh, then I ask the students, do you see a short O word here? Yes, Bob, Da. yes, very good. That's analytic phonics, analyzing words that you see in context. Same here. Do you see any short O words? Authentic writing activities. These don't need to be long, short, simple one to four minute activities writing a, a sentence or a couple sentences or a paragraph and i have a whole bunch of these described in my two different books there authentic means you're writing to express your idea or describing your experience that's an authentic writing activity this is what i use when i'm working online with students we can't write it's called a sentence mix-up they're still using the syntactic cueing system because they have to use grammar or word order. And I simply say, tell me when you know what the sentence is. And usually about here, and they can guess what the sentence is. And we go through these quickly. And again, I'm reinforcing the ah, the short O oh sound. Sentence mythos. And of course, daily reading practice. And children should have access to lots of good books that are at their independent level or below. It's okay to read easy books and good books that are of interest to them. Now with struggling readers and second language learners, sometimes getting a match between the reading level and the interest level is difficult. So we have what's called high low books, high interest, low readability. So if you're a fifth, sixth, seventh grader learning uh, they have books written at the first and second grade level. These are called high-low books. All right, some of the ideas I shared with you today. Two different models of reading. The phonological processing model, the neurocognitive model of reading, and some implications.